Hello, everyone. So you're filing into the Zoom room. Hello. Thanks so much for being here with us today. Um, this is the Brooklyn Rails 956th New Social Environment. I'm Carolyn, a Programs Associate here at The Rail, and I have the extreme, extreme pleasure and privilege of being your MC today for a conversation featuring Lotus Kang and C.A. Conrad. And we are so thrilled to welcome Poet Core Aliyah Ahmed here to close today's program. Before we get started, the Brooklyn Rail acknowledges Black Lives Matter and that here in New York, we are on Lenape Hoking, the unceded land and waters of the Wappinger, Canarsie, Muncie, and Lenny Lenape people of the Delaware Nation and Shinnecock Indian Nation. We recognize land acknowledgements are not a replacement for necessary decolonial work, but serve as a reminder of place, of the legacies of dispossession and enslavement that sustain and enrich the stolen land we're speaking from. Um, I personally cannot say that without also acknowledging the almost 16,000 Palestinians killed by the Israeli state and the U.S. government in the past two months. Every day we at the rail acknowledge that there is necessary decolonial work, and I find it um, at this point impossible when we speak of stolen land to not also at the very least acknowledge the daily occupation of Palestine we've all been witnessing. And I say this on behalf of myself and not, not the rail. Um, and I'm so honored to have Lotus and CA and CORE on here today, each of whose work inspires such transformation. Um, so thank you all again for joining. Lotus L. Kang works with sculpture, photography, and site responsive installation. Known for her sprawling installations and distinctive material repertoire, Kang's practice is a dialogue with the impermanent and the in-between. Her site-sensitive works explore the relational bonds between time, personal history, and cultural knowledge. She seeks to disrupt a human-centered perspective of the world with a broad curiosity for life and matter tangled in states of exchange that produce and are reproduced by their environments. C.A. Conrad, our host today, has worked with the ancient technologies of poetry and ritual since 1975. They are the author of nine books, including two published by UK Penguin in 2023, and a new collection of poetry, Listen to the Golden Boomerang Return, is forthcoming from Wave Books in 2024. They exhibit poems as art objects with recent solo shows in Spain and Portugal, and their play The Obituary Show was made into a film in 2022 by Augusto Cascales. Um, check the chat for uh, a link to, to their book. Thank you all again so much, and I'll turn it, all to, I'll turn it over to you, CA. Um, Carolyn, thank you. And uh, thank you everybody at the Brooklyn Rail. And um, Lotus, I'm so excited to be able to talk with you today. And, um, you know, do you mind if I, before we get in, I, I love that you said all those things, Carolyn, and you mentioned what's happening in Palestine. And, and I also want to remind everybody that the United States is responsible for 360,000 civilian deaths in Iraq alone. You know, I mean, we're still occupying Iraq. So we, you know, we're not the heroes in this story by any stretch of the imagination. Um, but anyway, um, I'm so excited to be talking with you today about your work, your beautiful new show. And let me get my little cheat sheet up here. I'm going to be, I found this way of sharing the images so that I can, so you can all see what we're talking about. Can you all see that just fine? It's good. At Lotus, the first question I wanted to ask you was, the metal structures suspending your work are filled with holes? As, as soon as I saw this, it made me think of ancient temples having holes in the roof uh, to open the way to the gods, to their heavenly realm. And I'm not sure what you had in mind with that, but I was I was wondering if the holes play a role in this for you. Uh, hi, everyone. Thank you, Brooklyn Rail, and thank you, CA, for this. Um, I love that you want to start with holes because <laughs> very much so something that I was thinking about a lot with this exhibition. So this is a view we're looking at from Contemporary Art Gallery in Vancouver, 
um, of the show in Cascades, which this was the second iteration. The show was a co-commission between Chisholm Hill Gallery and CAG Vancouver. So this was the iteration that I installed in September. Um, and so, you know, the, the kind of um, the installation and the um, ghostly architecture proposed by the film is different in this one, in this space than in the previous space. But the scaffold system that you're pointing to remains mostly the same. So I can, I'll talk about what that, that material is firstly, which is, it's called super joist. Um, you know, I find that a lot of my process involves searching for an encounter with a material and that that process of searching um, can feel very, uh, you know, difficult or meandering or kind of like being in the dark or, you know, kind of moving within emptiness, which I think has a kind of relation to the holes that you're pointing out to. So this, when I was working on the exhibition, I was, um, I'd previously build, been building these like vertical sculptures that were made of wall building materials and the sculptures would stand up in space as this kind of wall that bisected a space. And I became more interested in pointing to um, a, a more like horizontal experience of what's above, but also what's below um, and extruding space in a different kind of way where a body is really moving both through it and inside and outside of it rather than just on either side of the thing. So I was looking for a material that could be, that was importantly pre-existing. So this is like a, you know, a, um, technically an off the shelf industrial material that is already existent in the world. Um, and I was looking for something that would be hovering above the viewer act as a kind of framework or scaffold or holder for the film and the architecture proposed by the film, um, but then also be left raw and vulnerable and visible essentially. And, you know, after much searching, I came across this wonderful material that is full of holes that, you know, reminded me of many other objects that I've been working with for the past number of years, including the lotus root, which is this, you know, rhizomatic tuber that's full of holes, less symmetrical than this, they're asymmetric holes. Um, but I'm interested in this material because, you know, it's meant to make ceilings and floors, um, but it's, it being comprised more of lack than of um, form or, you know, non lack I guess I'm interested in the fact that it's it's comprised of largely negative space or um that its form itself is kind of emptied out into these cavities and that these holes are actually what give the material fortitude and uh, structural integrity um and that I think very much so reflects my interest in holes or emptiness as a means to exploring form or what um, the whole or the emptiness as form itself. Um, yeah, maybe we can start it there then continue. I love that you were saying that, um, thinking about this, you said that this is off the shelf, which I wasn't aware of that until just now. Um, and that is meant for flooring and all that. I, I love how it looks up there with the work. It's it's really um, mesmerizing. I wanted to, um, you just mentioned the lotus root and I want to put mm -hmm. an image of the lotus root up there. I was so excited to see the lotus root. Here we are. Let's see. Um, it looks like, am I right in that the lotus root is there's a, 
a layer of maybe plastic between the joist and the lotus root. It's very yeah. Beautiful. There's um there's a layer of thin silicone that to me it's like you know it's supposedly clear but it has this kind of slight um secretion kind of colored uh tint to it and it's just we only put the roots in one of the joists so it's a detail in the show that could easily be missed you can only really see this from one side um but this was my way of you know i previously inserted sculptural elements into uh steel studs for uh, like other vertical works as a kind of like thinking about them as like these viscera but also as like these embedded recipes or you know embedded time um and so this kind of insertion of the root here was a way to like bring that relationship together um one of the one of like the research papers I was reading that kind of made me go into more holy things, I guess, was uh, this paper that studied the um, the structure of the lotus root and the kind of the pattern that the holes create. And, you know, these, I think it was written by engineers. They did a series of experiments where they like made these tubular structures with holes that became more or less like or dislike or unlike the lotus root and the more they kind of like swerved away from what the lotus root holes structure is like the the less kind of structural integrity the tubes held so there's this incredible thing of this thing existing in nature that has this ability to create strength and resilience through its through lack you know that if it was a solid form it wouldn't kind of have the same kind of integrity that it it currently does um, but yeah, I wanted to embed these smaller details into the work to have them act as like uh, punctuations or like an ornamentation in a way as much as it is like an embedded, um, I guess I think of them as recipes in a sense. Oh, I like that recipes. Speaking of recipes, many years ago, uh, back in the 80s, I had a... a a lung uh, problem for a while and I was prescribed lotus tea and to eat lotus root mm. and it helped immediately it's known to help lung issues so I don't know if you've heard of that that's amazing yeah and the lotus root is you know in Chinese medicine it would be considered white and white is a color associated with the lung organ so I can see why you were prescribed that and the lotus root I mean it is so new nutritionally dense you know like what I love about it it's that it's this solid I mean it's not solid it's full of holes but it's a tangible form that is created in the mud right like in darkness which is a kind of hole if you know a, a kind of expansive way of thinking about the hole but it's created in darkness and it's comprised essentially of everything it isn't or it's comprised of its environment it's this like filter this filtration system or like a sieve that's um, turning an entire ecosystem through its body and then its body kind of is created through that. So I love that the root is kind of what it is not. It holds that kind of contradiction. And then it gives us a beautiful flower. Yes, exactly. Are, um, it makes me think of, do you know that there's this haiku poet who's passed away many years ago now, but he lived in Camden, New Jersey, named Nick Virgilio. He was one of the more famous American haikus. And he has this poem. Let me see if I can get it. It's a haiku okay. that goes, water lily, out of the, or lily, out of the water, out of itself. It's very nice. Lives I love like that. Out of itself. That's Out of itself. So you know, I wanted to say that uh, most of us are used to seeing photographs or these other different results from film, but you are actually giving us the material of film itself. And I wonder if you could talk to us about that here. I'll put this image up. 
I'm just fascinated by the fact that we're looking at we're actually looking at film, not the not the photographs of film. It's something that's very exciting. I just wanted to talk with you about. Yeah, you know, I think that with the film, you know, in some ways, if some of these installations are like how I think of them as like bone and flesh or, you know, a body turned inside out, um, then there's this relationship between the building material, like the super joist, um, which is like this infrastructural material, and then the kind of substrata of photography, which is film and paper and all these things. Um, and because I'm also thinking about the body and time and memory and identity, all those things kind of relate to, um, you know, structures of becoming or, or um, blueprints for being, I guess. Um, as is our DNA. So I think my interest in the film is you're correct in that photography usually depicts something with a sense of like um, clarity or fixity. And I think in thinking about these, I don't think about these as photographs, but in thinking about them as, you know, image bodies or I call them skins, they are less interested in depiction and more interested in kind of like an ongoing index of the environment and in a way that is both um, legible and illegible. So all of these films in this view that we're looking at were tanned in various locations. Um, I call it tanning, it's essentially exposing, but I call it tanning. Um, and with this show, actually I found it exciting. I didn't do this in the Chisholm Hill iteration, but I brought in completely raw sheets of film or unexposed or untanned. So that's like that kind of bright, vibrant, bluish purple you see on the left in that, like what I was, me and Matthew Highland, the curator at CAG, were calling the super cluster of film where there's this kind of density um, where you can't really see all of it at once. Um, so that bluish one was, those are sheets of totally unexposed, um, untanned films alongside these other films that have existed between um, two, one to two or three years. So there were all these kinds of different senses of time and place and environment brought together. Um, the one on the right there, it has this big kind of like leak mark that was um, indexed by a, a, a rainstorm, a thunderstorm in the summertime, that one was tanned in a greenhouse. So yeah, the film is, you know, definitely not really interested in legibility or fixity and much more interested in thinking about, you know, environments, the body as this environment that's like constantly sedimenting different environments within itself while also seeping out, you know, they, they're, they're porous in that way. That's remarkable. Lotus, could you also tell us about the material itself? I mean, I don't know that much about film, but I've never seen film this size before. Is it the largest film ever that's made? I don't know. I mean, what is the, is it sort of an industrial use of film? I'm not sure what we're looking at. Yeah, it's normally, so it wouldn't be the exact same kind of film that's used in like a 35 millimeter camera, for example, but it goes through the same um, uh, like darkroom process, color darkroom process. So this film is, you know, when light passes through, it becomes translucent. So it moves between states of opacity and translucency, which is something I'm also really interested in with it in terms of like what is revealed or concealed or how perception is shifted depending on the environmental conditions around it. But this film is usually used in, it's 50 inches wide um, and it's used in things like light boxes for ads, you know, it's used in bus shelters. It's usually used in um, 
uh, context where there's like a backlit component, like a light box. So, but it, you know, it's normally meant to hold images or, or text that these colors are only um, emergent through my like improper use of the material. So even when I've gone on, you know, experimenting with this material and understanding what it does or what it doesn't do has been just really through my own kind of experiments over the years, because even when you, when I would get on the phone with like the companies that make these and would, you know, figure out that like different brands create different um, kinds of colors that I nickname blood, bruise and bile. So this one on the right is like blood. Um, I wouldn't even be able to get an answer out of them of like, okay, when you take it out of the box and the bag, is it red or is it blue? And, you know, they would kind of think that I was crazy because you're not meant to expose this material to light. You're only really supposed to handle it in total darkness. When you and I were having a conversation um, for the book that came out in London, we were talking about your little, the greenhouse where you had some of the mm -hmm. film exposed. And at the time I was wondering, and this, it, this, it never came up in our conversation, but it was something that I was curious about then. And I was thinking mm -hmm. about, you know, the fact that you had those exposed 24 hours a day. Mm -hmm. I was wondering about moonlight, if moonlight could do it. And then I started mm -hmm. researching and it seems that like, moonlight doesn't carry the same rays like they scatter you need a certain range of the sun rays in order to affect film do you know much about i don't know it's just something i was thinking about it's just sunlight i believe right it's not moonlight i think it's just sunlight but i you know it's sunlight that we will there'll be some change that we can witness with our limited human perception however I think the moonlight certainly infects it in its own way, in the same way that we as bodies are kind of affected in both legible and illegible ways. So I loved that, that the film was kind of in this field of buckwheat in the greenhouse and witnessing full cycles of um, of days, you know, of time in that sense. And so I do feel like the moon did something to them. It's exciting to thinking about, you know, that there you are working with this material and you're relying on the substance from outer space to come. It's something, and it's like, that's one of the reasons I went back to like the holes and those joists, mm -hmm. you know, thinking about the ancient temples with holes in the roof to meet the gods, you know, so to speak. But you're literally dealing with something that travels for nine minutes out of outer space after it leaves the sun before it gets here. And one of the things I love about it is that in the middle of those rays of light, there are also radio waves. And I wonder um, sometimes how radio waves that come in with the sunbeams might affect film, but I, I don't know. Yeah, that's a good question. I'm not sure either how it would. Um, I do. No. Oh, sorry. Sorry, go on. Yeah, I'm not sure. You know, I've experimented with all sorts of, before the greenhouse um, became a viable option, I was basically trying to find ways to expose this material more in the wintertime. This was when I was living in Toronto, where like similarly to New York, there's not much sun in the winter, it's much colder there. Um, but I wasn't able to tan works in the same way. So I, you know, experimented by getting like reptilian lights, by getting um, grow lights. I took some things to a tanning bed and um, in the end, uh, the greenhouse ended up being the best solution and not even a solution, but it was, it was the most like exciting kind of prospect to build this architecture that is not fully you know, it's kind of like an in-betweener. It's not fully an indoor environment, not fully an outdoor environment. So it kind of, um, you know, complicates ideas of interior and exterior. 
Um, and, and then it br brought the work into such close proximity and intimacy with the environment. But I wanted to go back to something you were saying about this, me dealing with something that's so extra planetary, is that what you said or which? Oh yeah, so I was thinking about the fact that, um, I was thinking more, of, maybe when I was talking about the moon, whether the moon affects it or not, I'm not sure if that was, you, is that what you, oh, maybe you were meaning when I was talking about the holes Yes, and the sun, and just this thing, and it reminds you of ancient ruins. And you know, I think it in my search for materials, I am often searching for things that are pre-existing. So I think it, and the reason why I like pre-existing materials is that they have this earthly insistence. You know, I'm not interested in leaving the body and and the importance of what it is to be a body and but at the same time that I'm interested in materials that can become all these other things as you say like I think of spaceships and time travel um as much as I do like petri dishes and um you know uh the rockets within a camera that like kind of spool the film forward so it's important that the material always has all these associative qualities that don't really land on one thing or another um while also maintaining this like earthliness in a way even though they appear so unearthly i like that they it holds both you know i was thinking um, around the time when we were having our first conversation, mm -hmm. I was visiting a friend who's a, a ceramic artist and she was removing, she went with her to her studio when she was removing um, work from her kiln. And I was thinking, oh, this is, this is sort of like Lotus with her, with her, you know, Lotus has this, the structure she built where she's putting the film, this greenhouse and it's sort of like your kiln for film. It was kind of an exciting thing thinking about like you're actually building a structure to have the art be affected by the natural world. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I called it a tanning machine. Um, tanning. But, and I, you know, I've since put up a second greenhouse here in New York. Um, Denison Hill, which is a residency upstate, has supported hosting another greenhouse for you know maybe close to a year so I'm hoping that my first greenhouse was existent for just a few months for the summer you know where it's like peak sunlight longest days and now the first batch of film is in there and I'll go next weekend to like harvest it or move things around um and the shape of this second greenhouse is um it's a quonset shape which is you know it's this like semi circular shape which to me is more kind of intestinal um or or visceral in a way so i'm thinking about yeah these kind of infrastructure infrastructures or architectures of production as as it relates to our gut as well and what's held in the gut images memories um transformation happens as well Can we talk a little bit more about the the film itself, about film just in general? It has a very complicated history. And um, I would like to just share with you, let me just stop sharing that for one second. I have this, let me get it open. This is a book. Uh, by by Nisa Ramirez called the Alchemy of Us. She's a she's a a scientist, and she's a I don't I don't mean to sound rude, but most scientists I don't know I'm not particularly fond of their writing, and um, but she's extraordinary. I mean, it's just beautiful. This book it's so beautifully written because it's about there's one chapter in this book by Ramirez about photography, and um, she's basing this piece of writing that I'm about to read to you on the fact that. In the 1960s, when the 
public schools were desegregated in the United States. African-American mothers got to see their children alongside white children for the first time in school photographs. And they noticed that their children's features were, well, they were almost invisible. Like they were like a blur. You couldn't see their children. And um, there was a lot of controversy around this. And there were two London-based photographers, Adam Broomberg and Oliver um, Shannon, who in 2015 found that original film stock that was used. And this is what they found out. The film was optimized for white skin. The chemicals to dutifully pick up a range of colors had long existed ever since the periodic table of elements had become a standard item in most chemistry books. But there was a secret partiality in the combination of these elements used for the film's chemistries, favoring one range of color over another. It was this film's hidden history there was the reason faces in a class photo came out so differently. And I just wondered if you um, knew any more about the history. I was, uh, actually, I didn't know much about that history until I read um, and Anisia Ramirez's book. I highly recommend this book, by the way. Yeah, thank you. I wrote down that title. It sounds interesting. And I, just to follow your, I, the one thing I caught was your thing about not liking science writing. And I have a shared thing where I end up liking, um, you know, more kind of like feminist science and technology studies papers, which might be described as a softer science, or maybe like one that is um, aware of its existence um, in society, like a so I, I agree with your thing about hard scientists. Um, I did know about this. I, I, I did not know about the book, but I know about um, the project. And yeah, you know, it's, while I'm not um, explicitly responding to that, I'm aware of that. And there's something really interesting to me in that the film, the way that I work with it is inherently pushing against its prescribed mechanics. Um, it's engineered, what it was engineered to do, to, who it was engineered to include or exclude, et cetera. So, and what I'm more interested in and what emerges what, through that kind of resistance and it's, you know, largely um, non-linear, uh, non-representational and illegible or pushing against legibility. I thought you would want to respond to that because I just love when you talk about these, um, the, your work as skins. You've mentioned that in the past um, and just find that really beautiful. Yeah, and you know, skin is our largest or or skin is our largest organ. And we think of organs as existing within the body, but it's an organ we wear on the outside. So it's, it has a real vulnerability and volatility to it. I would like to share an image of, um, there's, I've, I've spent so much time looking at these images collected in your new show and which is the one, where is that? I'm sorry, I have a note right here. There it is. Let me get it open. I could look at this all day long. Um, there's just so much going on here. I love how we get to experience the reflections, which I'm, you know, are obviously going to be different wherever they're exposed and shown. And you can even see somebody's reflection over here. Um, when you look closer at it, these things, there's so much to look at. It's beautiful. I wondered if you could talk about this strand of, looks like little galvanized, you know, metallic knots. Yeah. Yeah, the, just to start with the reflective quality, um, maybe in a way to, as a kind of pushing against what the, the constraints or the dictates of this medium a bit by working with these, reflective surfaces that um, 
one are not depicting anything two are not used properly and then thirdly they when a viewer is encountering them they reflect within them the viewer's own distorted reflection so it's this kind of refusing of a of a you know a singular way of existing or that an implicating of the body on an immediate level um and then documenting the work also always becomes interesting because the person who's documenting the work is often implicated in it um and the way the joist is reflected in it and the lighting conditions of that particular day everything feels very kind of contingent in that sense um the piece you pointed out is called tract you know like an intestinal tract and it's comprised of 38 cast aluminum kelp knots um I've been interested in the figure of the knot for a number of years in thinking through a lot of the things that we've already talked about our kind of relationship or entangled relationship with the world or what we call the world outside of our kind of encased interior worlds. Um, and there's 38 of them to demarcate my 38 was kind of an important number within this body of work, though it's largely unseen in the exhibition. Um, when I, I was turning 38 when I was making the show and apparently my paternal grandmother was 38 when she fled North Korea on foot with her children. Um, and, and what, and you know, this work is thinking about um, migration and movement in a very uh, in a much more oblique way in an in, in an importantly and intentionally non-explicit way um, and then the border between North and South Korea is the 30th parallel so one of 30 appeared in this work in a number of ways this one being one of them the material list this the this is called track and then the material list for this is listed as 38 cast aluminum kelp knots, whereas other works where there's say cast cabbage leaves, I don't say the number. So 38 kind of became this important um, number to point out. And then some of the sculptures in the show had photographs embedded in the folds of the mattress folds. Um, and those were also photographs that documented a virtual performance I did on my 38th birthday as this kind of um, somatic invocation of um, my grandmother, but also thinking of a body in states of horizontality and verticality. That was a long-winded way to explain what these kelp knots were, but... Um, oh no, that was beautiful. I loved her. <laughs> that was great. And... Do you mind if we, um, I was so excited to see the rats, the baby rats uh, yes. in this show. And um, I would really like to ask you a couple of more questions. I wanted to show an image, two images of the rats that I'm really excited about. Here we, this is um, one where there are two of them together. The ones where they're to, they're, oh no, there are three of them there, I guess. Mm -hmm. And um, what I love about this image is that these little rat babies are feeling safe. Cause you know, the animals, when they, they're on their backs, exposing their vital organs. Mm -hmm. And then mm -hmm. there's this other one you have that I just, it was really, you could feel it. I could feel the moment you looked at it. Let me see, 14. It's this one. When the rat, when one of the rats is alone, they're on their, they're actually laying on their belly to not expose their soft vital organs. And I wonder if you could talk about the rats mm. and the placements and your ideas with having them in the show. And could you please tell yeah. us to the material they're made out of? They're cast glass. Um, I love what you said about the being belly up or belly down. I didn't think about them in that sense, but that you're right that when 
their belly up, they feel safe or they're, even if they're not safe, they're in an extremely vulnerable position. And I, maybe that's where I see their kind of kinship with the film. It sounds like a stretch, but to me, there is that they're both, they're these raw, vulnerable, you know, materials. The pup state of rats is also a very <clears throat> developmentally sensitive time. So it's volatile. And I think of the film as quite volatile as well. So there's this shared relationship for me between them while it's not immediately evident. Um, so I, I like that you kind of brought out that idea of being vulnerable and in this case kind of being a little bit less so and how one can choose to move through different states of that. Um, the rats themselves are, you know, they exist at the periphery of a space. They exist in the margins. I mean this as sculptures, um, as well as their the way they operate as a species. They do exist within infrastructures, in peripheral spaces, in marginal spaces. Um, they're incredibly resilient, uh, you know, incredible at proliferating and reproducing. Um, but when they're shown as sculptures, it's important for me that they also exist in the periphery so that they are these marginal, the marginal figures that kind of point to the membrane of a space, the limit of a space. So in a way, they're a way to remind us that there is an outside of this. Um, and in the show, there's, yeah, a series of these cast blast pups that are cast in these colors, like a yellow, there's this kind of visceral red. Um, I was thinking a lot about interior colors, you know, and bringing the inside out in a sense. Um, the pup, the rats themselves have a kind of like many tendrils of thinking around them. One being this science, the scientific study, the scientific paper written by what I would call soft scientists, not the hard scientists that <laughs> don't like to read, um, but that they, they were offering what they called like a cautionary perspective um, on how uh, life is narrativized via these non-human forms, such as rats. So they were looking at this study that these scientists did um, that observed how much mother rats licked their rat pups while they were in the pup stage. And it turns out that, you know, the more a pup is licked, the, the more resilience and strength it has over time through its life. It's, it's stress responses are better, and then it's in better states of health. That's um, beautiful. Then, I didn't know that. That's beautiful. Yeah. And I love this idea that it requires this kind of permeating of a membrane, you know, of the saliva to permeate an other's membrane in order to survive. Like if that's not like a um, metaphor for our existence, then I don't know what it is. But, um, but then what they also did was they took that information, which is incredible to think about. And then these hard scientists quickly narrativize that into um, narratives around good mothering and bad mothering and even love or, you know, not enough love, which didn't, um, didn't take in the reality that a mother figure is not this island or the singular form, but there's like a whole ecosystem and environment around the mother figure who gives it the capacity, more or less capacity to care or to love as they called it. Um, so these, the softer scientists were kind of critiquing these hard scientists. So that's where it began. And I was interested in that, in this kind of, um, yeah, the kind of volatility of that very larval or developmental period in an organism. But then I was also living in New York when I was reading, rereading that paper and there were rats everywhere. And so they were, you know, in my mind in a different kind of way. And then I was researching the rats in New York, which are supposedly endemic. The, the brown rat, which is now endemic to the city is originating from Asia on um, ships that were bringing, you know, food and grain over. 
so there's this kind of history of migration. So the rat is also this like migrant figure. Um, and, and then I'm interested in what we as humans deem parasite or kin and that they, they tend to oscillate between those roles when from our human centric human centric point of view, you know, they're parasites in the city and train stations and in all like the restaurant, like little um, outdoor shelters that were built during the pandemic. But then they're kin in science labs because they actually are mirrors of the human in many way and they help us understand ourselves more. So I was interested in kind of pointing to that, these like hierarchies that humans instate. Well, I just love that you're using rats in your work because, well, I, I'm, I'm, I just was working with rats for my last book um, and when I was in Rome. And, but the thing is about the rats that I wanted to say was that according to the World Wildlife Association, we've lost 70% of the wildlife on the planet in the past 50 years. And I just feel like it's time to stop poisoning and killing any creature. Frankly, you know, I've just, I don't know. Nobody wants to agree. Yeah, I remember you. <laughs> yeah, I remember you telling me about the rats um, in our conversation that you were, were you feeding them in Rome or? I would go to the fountain every morning to watch the sunrise. And there was an older woman there who would feed the rats with me. And the police will arrest you for feeding rats. So we did look out for one another. But the rats in Rome are not like rats I've ever experienced. And they're very soft um, when, you, when you pet them. And yeah, I mean, I've never petted a wild rat till I was there. Yeah, and didn't you say something about like um, when witches were killed or like they would kill the cats of the witches and the rats would proliferate from that? Yeah, I mean, there are some researchers who believe that um, a lot of the... Um, widespread like the bubonic plague and things like that spread so vastly because they killed all the women who had their cat you know the witches were killed and their cats were killed and yeah the rat population got out of control do you yeah, mind it, you know I, okay. oh. oh no go ahead no Sorry. i was just gonna say one last thing about the rats i call them sticky pups um and it feels related to the bubonic plague um, comment that you just made in that like you know rats as these supposed parasites we tend to regard them as these things that we can just eliminate or eradicate as if that doesn't come with other kind of fractal like consequences um so I call them sticky pups because it's the, it kind of is like thinking about our own sticky existence of what what sticks and what can't unstick in a way and, and the things that we kind of have to like um, cooperate with. We only have a less than 10 minutes, Lotus. And I was wondering if you would mind, I also put together a, um, a PDF of all the photos. Do you mind if we go through them so everybody could see the images of the yeah, show? And, and um, maybe we could just stop and talk about things as well. So this is, let me get a little smaller. I think you can see that. Mm -hmm. Do you mind talking these about the these sculptures? Back? Oh, yes. Do you mind yeah. Talking? So these were the sculptures, you know, when you talked about the sun and radio waves, I call these receiver transmitter and each have their own kind of like nicknames and brackets. So this one was uh, Perilla fruticens, which is the scientific name for Perilla. Um, and these house the photographs that documented my ritual performance that lasted for 38 minutes on my 38th birthday. Um, and this one has castellum Perilla leaves and pigmented silicone. And then behind it, the next slide that you went to is a work called Leak. And that is a whole series of different cast aluminum objects and debris and parts that didn't make it in the show, but felt important to address as this kind of excess or what is 
contain that, you know, what cannot be contained or what is trying to be contained, I guess, somewhere between those two things. Um, also a work that is easily missed in the show. This is beautiful, Lotus. Can you talk about this? Yeah, that one is called uh, Receiver Transmitter Intervertebral. So they're cast aluminum intervertebral um, discs. So the, uh, the kind of cushions in between each of the human vertebra. Mm. Um, and there's two sets of them. So there's kind of two reoriented spines, but within them are things like cast bronze lotus root, there's some cast aluminum shiitake as well. And then there's sesame seeds under that sheath of silicone. There's sesame seeds and, under Yeah, there's some sesame seeds. You know, I've been like reading about how seeds inherit memories. Um, and my own grandmother was a seed keeper. She had a grain shop in Seoul after she fled to, after she settled in South Korea after leaving North Korea. Um, so was thinking about these different forms of inheritance and memory or um, things that hold memories. And these were the same masks that you used for your documentation of your 38th birthday when you were? Yeah, so in that, um, in that series of photographs, which is called Fleshing Out the Ghost, I... For 38 minutes, I moved between states of lying down and standing up on one of the mattresses in process in my studio with a lot of the work in the show around me in process. Um, it was, yeah, my body moving between states of horizontality and verticality over and over again. And there were 96 photos in total. And so those are kind of that ritual is, you know, now embedded in me and kind of un enacted in me in its own way. And it also ended up infusing these works as well. I would like to ask you about, here, let me find this image that's coming up. This, uh, this is really exciting. This is, um, this plastic that you're using here, it's folded and sealed here, but this, and it sort of feels like not so much pulling ways as like reaching towards something. Can you please mm. talk about this? It's yeah, that's a mattress that's wrapped in silicone. Um, I too liked that it wasn't, you know, as this sheath that is like covering or containing it. There's this area that you know is also resisting that like cleanly folded form. I thought of it as this kind of tail. And in both shows, I wanted that like kind of the reveal of the tail as the body moves through it as an important part where you you maybe see that first before you see other things. Um, and within there, inside of there is the mattress and the photographs, but there's also a drawing and a castellum and cabbage leaf. I don't know, I think this one more than the others always made me feel like it's it feels like um an altar but it also feels like um a grave in a sense like you know a a, a tombstone it, this one reminds me of death more than the others can you please say more about that can you please say more about that yeah, you know, the mattresses came in as this form of a vessel, you know, they're a holder for a body without a body being present. And the mattress is also, the tatami, importantly, is this, it implies a kind of portability or modularity as the film does, as the architecture does. Everything has this kind of sense that it could be, you know, put up, taken down, act and then unfurl again, you can kind of see how things would be uh, stowed away, which I think is also 
a, a kind of regurgitated inheritance that I carry in my own kind of, you know, material attractions or formal attractions as an artist. And the tatami has these layers, you know, I talked about sediment earlier that remind me of sediment or strata. And my own grandmother apparently slept at her grain shop because she worked there so much. So I was initially looking at these traditional Peruvian mattresses, but became more drawn to this as a form. And then, you know, also given the very complicated history between Korea and Japan, and my own interest in not um, not being not finding a state of like arrival or trueness, it felt more um, within what excites me to to bring in um, a traditional Japanese object into the space of this show. And then you know, going back to the mattress, in, I was thinking about the body in states of horizontality you know, what happens in states of dreaming, um, you know, there's communications that happen, there's messages that are downloaded, our cells are regenerated, so there's also cellular death, um, but then the body in states of horizontality and death as well, but al always as this kind of like you know, I don't make these things knowing what's going to happen. So like, I'm kind of thinking about it out loud as we're looking at this image. I'm like, I guess to me, it feels very much so about death, but then there's this like life spreading out of it through the tangerines and, and the paper kind of having this like expressive unfurling up this way. And I love that there's tangerines. I think about um, the goddess Aphrodite and that's that's one of her she's the goddess of love and that's one of her fruits you know you know there's so many more questions I have but it's two o'clock and it's Lotus thank you so much I'm so glad I asked you to explain more about the death issue because it's it's a great way of ending and it's beautiful and thank you for allowing me to talk with you about your work I think that thank you so much CA I love hearing how the work feels to you that's it's such like a treat to hear that. Oh, it's remarkable. And now, um, Carolyn, I think we'll field questions from the audience and thank you very much. Yeah, thank you both so much. Um, it's just been so beautiful to listen to both of you. Um, so we encourage folks to ask questions. Um, you can just raise your hand or put it in the chat if you'd like. Um, I'll go to my colleague, Eleanor, first today. Thank you, Carolyn, and thank you so, so much, Lotus and CA. This conversation has been incredible. Um, Lotus, your work is so special. So thank you for sharing with us about it. Um, when I was looking at your work, I was thinking a lot about um, Carrie Schneider's work. I'm not sure if you're familiar with her, but she also um, uses physical film as a medium on a larger scale. So I guess part of my question is if you are um, familiar with her work or if you have like any other artists whose work you feel particularly connected to or inspired by. And then I'm also wondering if you could speak a little bit more about scale and how you consider scale in your work. Um, I'm not aware, what's her name? Harry Schneider. Harry Schneider? Okay, no, I'm not aware of her work. I'll look it up. Thank you for that. Um, as far as other artist influences go, there's so many, and uh, I find that it's a hard question to answer on the spot because it, <laughs> I feel like it's like asking what, who your favorite band is or something, and then you can't think of anyone all of a sudden. One person that I do see who's here currently, who is certainly an influence in someone whose work I admire is Liz Station, um, who's written me some very interesting things about the film. So I'm kind of distracted by it, but um, very, I'm, I'm gonna save that for later. Um, and then in terms of scale, yeah, I think, I think of the work, not just the film, but, you know, I especially in, in Cascades, there's things that are quite large and monumental, but also things that are quite small and detail oriented. So 
I'm always thinking about this, my work in relation to what I think about as this like soft monumentality or what it means to like offer these spaces or sculptures and architectures that have a very clearly implied temporality to them or a very clear rawness to them. Um, so while they're kind of monumental in scale, they also push against that or at least propose monumentality as something that has a modularity or reiterability or a deconstructability to it. You know, I'd like to keep the parts of the things very evidently, like you can see how it was put up and you can see how it can be taken down. So all of its like mechanisms are available to understand and that feels important to me in a way to address scale is something that can take up space, but also maybe push against that in a sense too. Thank you so much, Lotus. Yeah, thank you. Um, I just see another question here from uh, David. Um, David, I don't, I'm gonna give you the chance to unmute if you want, otherwise I can just ask it on your behalf. Um, uh, Okay, I'll, I'll read it for you. Um, David says, I, I love, love this idea from Lotus of thinking about seeds as genetic memory, which resonates so nicely with CA's ideas around sonic presence slash sonic absence from resurrect and extinct vibrations. As species go extinct, their bodies and sounds also disappear. I wonder if you two could talk about sounds and memory a bit more. That's in the chat there. I love that. I mean, yeah, so my interest in apparently seeds inherit memories from their mother's seed. Um, and that memory is a genetic imprint of the temperature at which the mother seed sprouted. So it holds this kind of information of when to itself sprout. And then through the next generation, that memory is reset or, you know, it's placed to the next generation. Um, and I just loved learning about that in that seeds point to cycles of life and death and growth and renewal of dispersion of multiplicity. But then, you know, there's this thing of like, wow, seeds hold memory, human memory and inheritances are just wildly beyond what we understand or what, or how we can know them or how inheritance is held or expressed. Um, in terms of sound, maybe CA, you want to jump in with the resurrect extinct vibrations. Well, I'll be brief because this is, I really want to focus on you, but thank you. I'm going to just quickly just throw this in the chat for everybody. Where do you go for everybody? Everyone in the meeting. Okay, here we are. Um, this is the material. Thank you for asking that, David. Um, I'll just very briefly say that I this book that I just put over there in the chat, I I wrote the book by traveling around. I got a creative capital grant to be able to finish it. I went to all 50 states and I would lie on the ground and flood my body with the field recordings of recently extinct animals. I'm almost 60 now, so I was looking at creatures that have passed away in my lifetime, which, you know, there are very many of them. And um Yes, I agree. This idea. Let me just end by saying I wanted to focus on an eco poetics that was more less about um, this degraded soil, air and water and more about vibrational absence that when a species mm -hmm. leaves the planet, they take all of their sounds with them and not just the ones we normally think about, but their heartbeat, their their wing flutters, their breath gone. And we've lost 70% of the wildlife. And according to Alex Renton from The Guardian newspaper in London, he wrote a very um, extensive series of articles called The High Price of Cheap Meat. He believes that we have crossed a line in the past half decade where there are now more incarcerated or animals like incarcerated for their flesh and their fur and their eggs and their milk than there are wild ones. So it's something to think about. And yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I love the vibrational absence thought that like 
maybe this goes back to the holes that you wanted to talk about first in this. Um, and I love David's question as well. It's a question that's hard to answer because sound is something I'm also still thinking through, like what does, you know, the sound of absence um, or holes and it's not an it's not an answer or a completed thought at all, but um, just to say I appreciate the question a lot, and I love that um, I have the book you shared, and I love it very much. Also, yeah, well, thank you, thank you, David, so much for that generative um, question. Um, so, unless there's any more questions, last call. Um, I'm so happy to turn it over to Cor for a closing um, reading today. Um, Cor Aliyah Ahmed is a writer and artist living in Brooklyn, New York. They make videos, drawings, poems, and plays. Their work has been shown with Interstate Project, 77 Mulberry, Alyssa Davis Gallery, Rhizome, Bomb, and uh, the Poetry Project too, I think, and their manuscript. Their book is forthcoming with Wendy Subway next year, so definitely look out for that. And thanks, Coral. It's over to you. Thank you, Carolyn. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. Okay. That was so nice to listen to both of you. Um, I'm really happy that Carolyn asked me to be part of this. And both of you are really inspiring mentors to me. I'm just going to read and not really explain it. I can't close my eyes to the image of souls of our dead rising. It's what is there when I close my eyes, their eyes and hearts taken to be targets, mutilated and blinded. To shout defiance and repetition, I lose my breath. We can speak this way to lose our breath and disarrange expected caliber, puncture the stated pulse. We carry a sore gasp to remind us that we are alive. Following protests, we wound each other across our disjoined journeys, left teetering between being scattered, again gathering, and then reorienting. Sid asked, do you think shadows are part of the thing they silhouette, or are they separate entities? It's part of the thing, part of the thing in the way that color has been because of light upon it, and light makes shadows. We watched the ribbons hung from their ceiling lamp cast shadows that trailed flowing along the ceiling, making two swimmers in the air, arms behind, bobbing through the current, an attempt to be with each other in water. Can we trouble the idea of peace if we think about it as something that someone can have? Who has had it? The people who own it soak the sky with the weight of their oppression, obliterating, spewing death and us as people colonizing where we are today need to recognize our hypocritical fantasy of freeing Palestine. In our exile, there is a settler colonial collusion. How to decolonize our relationship with the divine? Our integration in diaspora arrives at the expense of black and indigenous people without interrogating this makes us no different from Zionist settlers in Palestine. Palestine will not be free unless Black people in America are freed and indigenous land is repatriated and rematriated. I hope for a phoenix. Okay, I have to find my other thing. But... I'm going to read something that was part of my thesis project this summer. Um, it has sort of a funny rhythm, so I'm, I haven't read it out loud so much, so we'll see how it feels. Vault, cell, mouth, please maze birth, I molt space, I air, flex song, six sim, Exalt, Axis, Exquisite, Coax, Skate Lace, Cleft, Treble, Phoenix, Wants, Fascia's Gaze, Truth's Color, 
creature's line, eclipsed wings. Exceed wheel, persists flight, staccato blame. Control blur, phantom thrust, tempered beg, fixate one. Pain without hurt, pain without hurt. Please regret, protein fold, signal wound, virulent, pinch membrane. Spit, divide ink, spit bakes a loop, itself you. The color of magic is always transforming, but I mostly think of it as purple. I met someone who ran a science podcast and made an episode on color. She said purple isn't real, that there is no actual wavelength for purple. Red and blue are far from each other on the circle of sight. She knew someone named Sheila from middle school who had two extra cones in her eyes so she could see more colors, more complicated colors of blue. And she said that when she came outside, she'd be able to see the stuff coming out of the sun as though it was texture. I wonder if it's like the breath of the sun. Lucky to be able to see that. Hay pulled up by the sun, expressed slow flecks of gold wafting over. Apparently she was really mean. What does it mean to see more complicated shades of blue? Certain tiny shrimp can see billions more colors than us. What if God suddenly granted me a different color every time I do something good? That's how I thought it would work when I was little. When purple bursts out of the ice at the spring equinox, a breath close to the ground rises to gather our memory. Seeing the crocus as a surprise, it's like someone calling to someone outside and it's just a blurred word. A wind chime swaying just slightly, the eyes of a ceramic animal knowing still love, cars hum leaving the street. In transmutation, the space between me and myself is precisely the space of echo. It's a repetition of the same that is also always different, a call to the same self. I was watching me move from chrysalis into moist lava, wings slowly shrinking back scorched. There's latency, then following that a return to the earlier stage, corresponding to a death or an unbirth, as if it were possible to return to before and revive. To know might kill it. I fall down a hole, but the fall is oddly horizontal. The scream stays beating in my chest. Echo disembodies themselves in a scene of originary dispossession, alienation. Almost dive, almost dead, and almost alive are equivalent. Being over you and all over you feels the same. Reverberation expresses almost sound through silence. Without a body, echo expands, spreads through the world. She lives in forests, rocks, trees, and caves as reverberation, resonance, voice, and vibration. The fluid serves as a cushion. The skin begins to split. The exoskeleton hardens, curling back upwards, swallowing air. I might have told you I was guided through a set of drawings last spring, filled a whole pad, felt my hand guided by a fourth, shapes and visions, haptic pitches, my hand skating on the fog, a song unfolding as I moved through and with it. I was convinced it was a divine intervention. I went to trees and bathed in a stream, pushed a car out of the mud, fearing time running out. I was high and I was manic, dipped every finger into candles, found myself biking through the city a couple 6 a.m.s in peach light, mapping birds, finding centrifugal force in every circling. I hadn't slept for days, but that reassemblage is not nothing. We move through the divine anyway. That's it. Wow, Cora, thank you so, so much for your reading today. It was beautiful, really nice way to close out um, such an amazing conversation. Thank you again, Lotus and CA for today.
Um, I also want to thank Matthew at CAG Vancouver for their support in preparing for today's event. Um, at the rail, we also like to thank the Terra Foundation for American Art for sponsoring our NSC program and making these daily conversations possible and for their support of our growing archive. Today's conversation has been recorded and will be up on our YouTube channel shortly. Help keep the rail free. We are fundraising $200,000 this season to directly support our writers, guests, artists, production staff, and operations for the coming year. It's a small nonprofit. We need your support. Donate at the link in the chat to help us meet our goal. Join us tomorrow at 1 p.m. for a poetry reading curated by Philip Marinovich with Leah Flax, Barbara E. Briskin, Casper Lee, and Ali Pinkney. And as is real tradition, you can now turn on your microphones and say hello and goodbye as you leave. Thank you all again so much for coming today. Thank you so much, Lotus. Thanks, Lotus. Thank you, Lotus. Thanks, Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.